Good morning. Glad to have you all here. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us online. We're glad to have you join us as well. Uh, we, uh, we will begin this morning as we do each Thursday morning, or most every Thursday morning, with a couple of our young people to share their scripture with us. So, Zach? Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I like this verse because it says that God has plans for us. I see in this verse that when I am in a time where I don't know what to do, I should remember that God always has a plan for me. Dear God, thank you for always having a plan for our lives. Please help us to remember that you are in control of all of our situations. Amen. Revelation 7 verse 17 says, For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I like this verse because it describes what it means to be led by Jesus, and it shows me all the good things that come from following him. I see in this verse that Jesus only wants what's best for me, and he'll give me anything I need to fulfill this promise. Please fold your hands, bow your heads, and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding us to whatever we need. We ask that you help us to not take your countless blessings for granted. In your name we pray. Amen. Great. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Any announcements? Nobody gets an announcement today? All right. Oh, yeah, I've been reminded. We have a birthday among us. Judy is uh, celebrating her birthday today. Judy Bender. So uh, let's sing happy birthday to Judy. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Judy, happy birthday to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and a, uh, a welcome to uh, Eli's with us today, one of our uh, college students, pre sem <laughs> Uh, he's uh, actually gets to learn Greek. Questions. Pardon? You can ask him a bunch of questions. Oh, yeah, all right. Yeah, he's an expert by now. He's got a couple of years of pre sem said. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, someone sent this to me. I appreciate it. This was found in a church in France. When you enter this church, it may be possible to hear the call of God. However, it's unlikely he will call you on your mobile. Thank you for turning off your phones. If you want to talk to God, choose a quiet place and talk to him. If you want to see him, send a text while driving. <laughs> All right, whatever. And uh, my wife got me this T-shirt. I only have two faults. I don't listen and something else. <laughs> And finally, if a man says he will fix it, there is no need to remind him every six months. <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> okay. Um, here we go. Okay. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, gracious Lord, for the day and for the opportunity to delve into the letter that your servant Jude sent to the people uh, of the first century. But may his message to them of old be a message to us as well today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, we finished up James last week and we said we would look at the letter of Jude. Um, if you can't find it, go to the very end, the book of Revelation, and it's one page in front of it. It's, it's only one page. Um, it's one of the few books. If somebody says that they read Jude chapter 2, don't believe them. <laughs> There's only one chapter. Um, let me just give a, a, some a introduction to Jude before we read it, just to kind of get, uh, get our minds going in the, in the right direction. Jude warns against believers, supposed believers, they say they were, but they weren't, who practiced a very perverted lifestyle. And we'll go into detail in what that perverted lifestyle was in a few minutes. But uh, that's the purpose of it. And he urged them to continue in godliness and love and closes the letter with a very beautiful doxology. 
Who is the author? The writer identifies himself in verse 1 as a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Um, that That's helpful, but not entirely. There were a lot of Jameses and Judes in the first, or Judas, is Jude is really short for Judas, so it's the same name. And there were a lot of them in the New Testament. There were two disciples named Judas, one of which by ill fame is Judas Iscariot, uh, and then there's Judas the brother of James <laughs> in the uh, apostles. Well, all right, um, the, uh, no, that was the son of James. Yeah. Then, and then we had um, Ju Jesus uh, in, in uh, Luke 16, uh, in Matthew 13, I'm sorry, Jesus had a brother named Judas. He had actually four brothers. Two of them, one of them was named James and the other named Judas. Uh, so who is it? Well, we had the same discussion when we talked about the author of the letter of James, that it was probably the brother of Jesus. Uh, and this is his brother Jude or Judas. So these are half brothers of Jesus who wrote these two letters. Uh, they don't claim to be a brother of Jesus because that would be a bit presumptuous. And so they don't make that claim. But Jude says he's the brother of James. Now, if you understand uh, how these, the, James and Jude were not believers when Jesus was in his ministry. They didn't follow him. They became believers after the resurrection. And James, because he's the oldest and the, uh, next to Jesus, the messianic family tree would go to him. Jesus was in the messianic family of David. And so as head of uh, that family and head of the church, he, J Jesus was first. And then when Jesus ascended, James came into prominence as the leader of the Jerusalem church. Well, James was martyred and now Jude comes into prominence. And so that's his his uh, position of authority uh, is that he is James' brother and thus has credence to be listened to. The other Judas, the other dis apostle, um, is not does not have that kind of, of credibility or that kind of uh, recognition. So it's undoubtedly the, the brother of James, the half-brother of Jesus who wrote it. Who did he, he wrote it somewhere between 65 and 80 AD, which makes it one of the later uh, books of the New Testament. And it's remarkably similar to 2 Peter, particularly the second chapter of 2 Peter. Yeah, there's more than one chapter in 2 Peter. Uh, and chapter 2 of 2 Peter is remarkably similar and sometimes word for word similar to Jude. And so there's a big discussion as to who copied who. Well, it could very well be that neither one copied, or they might have had a third source that they used. Um, they're similar, not the same author, but very similar content. Uh, and the letter is very general in nature. It could apply to anyone in the, in the New Testament church, whether they are Jew or Gentile. It does not have that designation of to Gentiles or to Jews. It's, it's sort of a, a broad-based uh, letter uh, that would go to to any Jew uh, or to any Christian, uh, regardless of where they are located, which makes it also very applicable for us because it could be a letter sent to us today. It has that kind of um, message to us that's very apropos for us today. Um, occasion, he wanted to write about the salvation of Jesus. We'll look at this in just a minute when we read the letter. Uh, but he was compelled to write about immoral people who were perverting the grace of God. Uh, they believed that being saved by grace gave them a license to sin. If God's going to forgive sin, let's just go live it up. Um, and that's essentially what they do. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into it. Some believe that he was referring to the Nicolaitans. Now, you may not have heard of the Nicolaitans, although if you've read Revelation, they're mentioned twice. John in Revelation condemns the Nicolaitans in two of the letters to the seven churches. He condemns them. Um, one, one church, for he, he, he uh, 
uh, supports them because they rejected the Nicolaitans. The other one, he's not sure because they seem to buy into it. Nicholas, if, if, if the train of according to tradition is, is to be followed, Nicholas was one of the first seven deacons. You remember the story in the book of Acts where the widows came and complained to the apostles that they were being skipped in the distribution of food. They were Greek-speaking Christian widows. And so uh, the apostles said, let's appoint seven deacons to take care of this. Stephen was one of those seven who was the first martyr. Nicholas was another one. Well, we don't hear much about Nicholas after that, <clears throat> but it is believed that he's the one who developed a theology that was permissive to the extreme, uh, believing that grace, if you know where Paul says, um, the more sin abounds, the more grace abounds, well then, let's get a lot of grace, and we get a lot of grace by sinning, so let's go. And that particularly became perversions of sexual sin, um, and, um, and that was, uh, and, and then grace covered it. So the Nicolaitans were, was a, was a sect in the early church. It's interesting how quickly, how quickly the gospel of Christ gets perverted. Uh, right away in the early church, it gets twisted. There were, it was twisted by some who wanted to be legalists and said, no, they can't be just believers in Jesus. They had to follow all of the Old Testament rules. Paul talks about that in Galatians and Ephesians. And no, that's a twisting of the gospel. That's not what it says. Well, this is a twisting the other direction. If it, it is not, you, you don't have to obey the law. You don't have to do anything because God's going to forgive it. So you can just do whatever you want. So right away in the early church, there are these false teachings that that develop. Some also think that in J Jude is referring to the beginnings of what was known in the second century as Gnosticism, uh, from the Greek word uh, gnosis, which means knowledge. Gnosticism had a variety of forms, but became a rather pervasive heresy in the second century. Uh, according to Gnosticism, there were two branches of Gnosticism. Uh, but both of them had the same basic idea that if you had the right knowledge, you know, sort of like if you had the password, then you could get in. Uh, and so there was this secret knowledge that they had. Some of them took it to they had to have a very austere lifestyle, very rigid, very uh, de de depriving themselves of everything to gain that knowledge. Others went the opposite direction and that said, if you had that knowledge, you can just sort of live any lifestyle you wanted, which always included sexual sins. So there are traces of early Gnosticism in the references, but it hadn't really developed yet when Jude wrote his. Uh, another side note is that the people of God have been plagued by uh, sexual perversion throughout the story of the Old Testament and the New Testament. What was Baal worship that was continually consumed? Baal worship was an essentially, a Baal was a fertility god. And how do you worship a fertility god? By being fertile. And so you had cult prostitutes, male and female, uh, that if you really wanted the, your land to produce, you had to go worship Baal by attending the cult prostitutes. Um, the Old Testament dealt with it all the time. That's why Moses and, and, is insistent, and Joshua, don't follow the, the, the uh, gods of the lands where you are going. Follow the God of the Old Testament. Well, they said, yeah, we'll do that, and then they immediately went off. And so, and that pervades the Old Testament. Uh, it, it, so much so that the worship of Yahweh and the worship of Baal got so intermixed they didn't know which was which uh, until um, who was the king uh, that found the Bible in the, in the temple it did, in renovations of the temple remember which one that was Eli? Uh, either Josiah or Hezekiah Josiah yeah Josiah uh, thank you so you did learn something in school yeah. <laughs> um, author the, the renovation of the temple and they found the, the book of the, the Torah and they read it and they went, oh my word, that's what we're supposed to be doing uh, and caused a, a religious revival. 
Paul dealt with it in Corinth and others. They had the high places. They had um, places where the ritual prostitution carried on. So throughout the history of the Christian community, that's been an issue. And it's still an issue today uh, that we have to deal with that kind of perversion. Okay. With that background, uh, let's read... Um, well, let's just read the letter. Are you ready? With, are you ready for that? Oh sure. You want to just do that? If you don't want to read all of it, stop and we'll let someone else read for a bit. Jude. Turn yourself on. There you go. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God for a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, those, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning, unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom black, blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of, the, of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These men are grumbles, grumblers and fault finders. <clears throat> they follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority <laughs> through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. That was quite the feat. Thank you for doing that. I thought it would be good just to listen to the to the whole letter rather than just piece it up uh, and, and he hear the whole content. The, the, 
One of the difficulties that we have with any of the letters of the New Testament is that we don't know the, why they were written. We have to as figure out why they were written from the uh, content. In other words, they give you the solution. We don't know quite what the problem was. Well, J Jude does a pretty good job of outlining what the difficulty was. Let's, let's just take it apart. He talks about himself as being a servant of Christ and brother of James. We talked about that earlier. And verse 2 is really kind of a benediction where uh, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I made a little note that uh, if you're using the uh, NIV, which is what Linda read, the word may is not in there. The ESV puts the word may in there. The Greek doesn't have it. It's implied. And my preference is that the word may is not in there because that makes it a prayer. It's not a prayer. It's a statement of fact. The same thing about the benediction that we do on Sunday morning. We don't say may, we, sometimes we fall into it, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. But it's really a statement. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with us. Um, and so I think that's what this is. That's just a little side note. Verse 3, uh, he's eager to write to them about sin and grace, about our common salvation. He wanted to just uh, share uh, that good news again. But there were compelling reasons for him to write uh, something else. The teaching of grace was in jeopardy. Verse 4 gives the problem. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were de designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Um, put your finger in the place and turn back to the, to the book of Romans. One of the first letters uh, in the New Testament, the letter of Paul to the Romans, the fifth chapter. Go to Romans chapter 5. Um, and so he writes, I'm, I'm picking it up in verse 20 of Romans 5. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as sin reigned, grace would reign. Then verse chapter 6, verse 1. What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul answers the question clearly, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Uh, and then he goes on to explain that as baptized children of God, a lifestyle of sin is not the way we live. But there were those who took that phrase of Paul, that as sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, and said, well, then they didn't hear what Paul says, no, that's not the way to live. They said, yes, that's a good way to live. We'll just live our sexual perversions and God's grace is going to forgive it. Uh, and so they just um, let go uh, to do whatever they want. Uh, and this could be the reference to the Nicolaitans or something similar. Uh, the condemnation was written about, he says. The reference may be to the Old Testament denunciations of this lifestyle, or he's referring to Enoch's prophecy, which he gets to in verses 14 and 15. Judgment is about to fall on them because of their sin. Their sin was to assume that the grace of God gave them the right to sin without uh, restraint. Unless you think that's an ancient idea, I've dealt with it many times down through the years people who really believe, well, God's going to forgive me, isn't he? Well, yeah. Well, then it doesn't matter what I do, right? No, <laughs> that's not right. And so you have this tension of the grace of God is an all-encompassing grace that forgives everything. But if we are repentant, which is how we understand what God's forgiveness is all about, if we are repentant, Part of repentance is I'm not going to do that anymore. To repent is to turn around, to go a different direction. And so repentance means I'm sorry for what I've done. I won't do it again. And it's in that context 
that we understand the grace of God coming to us. So God's grace is not a license. It's rather the assurance that because of our sin, God does not reject us. But we, children of God, baptized children of God, want to serve God, and we do that by being obedient to his will. And if you read on in Romans 6 and 7, that's exactly what Paul uh, describes. And so that was the problem, that, that the reason for Jude writing this letter uh, to, to uh, warn the Christians of this kind of perverted uh, teaching and lifestyle. Um, he gives in verses 5, 6, and 7 three examples of divine judgment. Um, and you need to, under, to know a little bit about the Old Testament. He assumes that you know much of the Old Testament stories. Uh, re, he wants to remind us, verse 5, that uh, although you have once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, actually the word Jesus is there. It really is the word Lord, uh, which could be... Um, it's, it really refers to God, saved the people out of the land of Egypt, and destroyed those who did not believe. There's always been a history of people who don't believe. You remember? They sent uh, spies into Canaan, and the spies came back and said, no, nope, we'll never be able to win. We can't possibly uh, accomplish it. And, those, and so a whole generation stayed in the wilderness because of that unbelief. That's what he's referring to in verse 5. Verse 6. Um, the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. Second Peter has a similar passage. Uh, indeed, uh, what Second Peter makes clear is that there was a group of angels uh, led by Satan who rebelled from God and went their own way. These were confined to hell. It's the only place in 2 Peter where anyone is sent to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. Jesus makes that clear in the parable of the sheep and the goats when he said, go to the place prepared for the devil and his angels. He doesn't say go. He said that's what you choose. If you reject Christ, you're choosing that. You're not sent there. It's just what that's where we end up if we reject Christ. Um, so those reject Christ, and he doesn't send us. Uh, and so what he's referring to, and the only places in Scripture that this is mentioned, Second Peter and here, about a group of angels who rebelled and were chained in their rebellion, if you will, uh, and became the devil and his angels, still re re reaping havoc on the world, uh, but nonetheless... Um, confined to hell. That's the second example of the judgment of God. God judged them. And so the third example is so Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a story that we're more familiar with. Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding cities. Uh, the surrounding cities were also Adma and Zeboim, but we don't hear about them. Um, but uh, those cities were destroyed because of their sexual immorality uh, and they pursued an unnatural desire um, it's very similar what Sodom was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah it was was going on in the world before the flood <coughs> sexual perversions of the worst sort and that's what caused God finally to send the flood this place is just a mess we're going to start over uh, and, and did so uh, and so the rainbow is a sign of God's grace, which is interesting. You've been appropriated by a whole group of people uh, who think it is a license to do, follow their lifestyle. It's not. Uh, it's the reminder that you, you better be glad you got that rainbow because otherwise you'd be swimming a long time. <laughs> um, but God won't do that again. But. Uh, that's that's the kind of sexual perversion that he's talking about. Um, and they are an example because uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is an example because they uh, went the punishment of 
eternal fire. God destroyed them by pouring out burning sulfur, um, is what Genesis tells us. So that was their sin. And Ju Judas it reminds them that's the punishment for that kind of sin. Uh, that's where they ultimately end up. The implied message is, don't do that. If you don't want, if you want to avoid that kind of judgment, don't go there. Leave it alone. That's not the way of Christ, and it's not the way of God. Um, so I'm going to stop for a minute and see if you got any questions before I just keep plunging on to the rest of this book. You catching the the connections, the illusions? Okay. Any other comments or questions? When you refer to the, the spies who spied out the land and they came back with a bad report. Right, right. And how quickly all the people just believe those ten and not the, the two. Isn't that interesting? Yes. And the word of God that said, you can do this. Oh, no, we can't. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how quickly they believe that small group. Well, they must be right. Uh, no, they weren't. <laughs> And we do the same thing. We believe these rumors that come out. Oh, it's got to be true. Yeah. Well, no. Um, there's a there's a uh, ca uh, cartoon that you, is no longer um, uh, um, out anymore, and it was about uh, Opus, a uh, penguin. And uh, Opus the penguin was telling about living in the Falklands. And uh, were a million penguins, and the, and the, the uh, British had their jets flying around in Falkland because they claimed that. And he said they had all these penguins out there, and the jets would fly from one side to the other, and all the penguins would go this, and then they'd fly the other way, and they'd all go that way. And then they'd fly directly over, and all the penguins would go this and fall flat on their back. <laughs> What's the point? Even if a million people do a foolish thing, it's still a foolish thing. <laughs> So, no matter how many people are doing it, it's still, that's not the way to go. Okay, verse 8. In like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh and um, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. They, uh, these godless men who are out of touch with truth and reality, they're dreamers. They, number one, polluted their own bodies, defiled the flesh. Number two, they reject authority when authority says no, that's wrong. And they blaspheme even the angels, the messengers of God. Uh, celestial beings is one translation, glorious ones is another, but they defy the messengers of God. And then he refers to um, an interesting tradition that we don't know much about. There was a book in the first century or a writing called The Departure of Moses. And it was about what happened when Moses died. From Deuteronomy 34, we know that God uh, brought M Moses up on Mount Nebo. From there, he could see across the Jordan Valley to the whole promised land. We were on Mount Nebo once, and we were told, if you get up on there, you can look over there, and you can see the whole promised land. We couldn't see anything. It was so foggy, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, <laughs> we saw nothing. <laughs> But nonetheless, we, that's what we saw. On Mount Nebo, Moses died, and Deuteronomy says God buried him there. And no one knows to this day, it says, where his body was. Well, there is a legend that Satan wanted to reveal his burial site so that the people of Israel would find it, and they would put a shrine there, and they would worship that instead of God. And the, Mike, the archangel Michael stopped him and prevented him from doing that. That's the story behind what's said in verse 9. When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. His point was not to debate that story, but to say that Michael, even though he had the authority to ridicule and put down these people didn't do that he let the lord take care of it god will judge them it wasn't his position to do that on the other hand these people contrasting that verse 10 these people blaspheme all that they do not understand 
uh, and are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So they reject the, the message of God about this, but their lifestyle, uh, a lifestyle of sexual perversion, will ultimately destroy them. Um, and that's his own point of bringing up the whole story about Moses, is that they, the angel Michael did not presume to be the one who pronounced judgment. Uh, only God will do that, yet they do that all the time. So, verse 11, woe to them. And then he, he gives uh, in verses 11 uh, and uh, uh, verse 11 and 12, uh, verse, verse 11, three examples of God's judgment. And here you need to know uh, your Old Testament. First example is Cain. You remember what happened with Cain? Cain, the brother of Abel. Cain killed Abel. Cain was a murderer. He was driven by jealousy and pride. Uh, so God destroyed them, destroyed him, uh, punished him. Second is Balaam. Do you remember the story of Balaam? Balaam was a prophet, not a prophet of God, a prophet out for his own ends. And the king of Moab said to Balaam, I'll pay you a bunch if you go curse the Israelites, and then I can win the battle. And Balaam says, sounds like a deal. And he went to curse him, and the donkey wouldn't move, wouldn't go anywhere. And he couldn't get the donkey to go. And finally, the donkey said, why are you beating me? Hello. <laughs> And then he saw what was the, what the donkey saw was a barrier. An angel was there stopping him. And Balaam ended up, twice ended up prophesying in favor of Israel against Moab. And the king goes, no, 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 that's not right. Well, Balaam did it a couple of times because he said, I can't help it. That's what, I, that's what God said I had to say. Well, Balaam was, was out for himself. That's the reference to Balaam, that he was there for his own greed. Um... Uh, and then Korah's rebellion in number 16 Korah was the leader of a group of people who rose up against Moses leadership and tried to usurp Moses leadership and they ended up all being swallowed up by the earth um, and so they were judged all, and the only point in, in listing these is remember there are three here's just three examples of God's judgment on people who refuse to follow his direction. Don't go there. Don't do that. Um, and then verses 12 and 13, he gives six graphic metaphors. <laughs> Let's see if I can trace these for you. These are, here's the first one, hidden reefs at your love feasts. Well, what's that? Well, actually, we have love feasts twice a, mo twice a month in our worship services. These are communion celebrations, and he calls them love feasts. Paul makes a similar kind of reference. Uh, this is where the love of Christ is shared with us, and where the people share that love of Christ with one another. It was a big, it's like, sort of like, it's a potluck meal with communion, is the model that Paul is talking about, and that's what Jude is making reference to. These are the love feasts. But they pervert them. How? by in, insinuating or getting themselves in there, and then maybe even in some cases, do is believe, that they twisted those love feasts into sexual perverted feasts. Um, and that may be what they were doing in some of those. So they are hidden barriers, hidden, uh, hidden uh, blemishes uh, at these love feasts. Uh, they are shepherds who feed themselves the implication is the shepherds don't feed the flock. Uh, they only take care of themselves. Uh, thirdly, they are waterless clouds swept along by the wind. They are clouds without rain. They are clouds that promise rain but don't ever deliver. So they promise things but don't, they can't deliver. There are preachers like that uh, out in our world that promise all kinds of things but can't deliver. Uh, they are fruitless trees in late autumn. When do, uh, when do fruit trees bear their fruit? In autumn. And they're like trees who have all the promise of the summer. Oh, look at this beautiful tree. It's just gorgeous. And you come to the fall to pull, pick the fruit, and there's nothing there. Similar like clouds without rain. They promise a lot, can't deliver. There's nothing there for them. They are wild waves of the sea, verse 13. The ways of the sea uh, stir up filth. 
uh, and um, is a, a, of no good. And then the um, wandering stars, they're like shooting stars that are there for just a moment and then are gone into the darkness. And they are like shooting stars who will end up in the darkness. So those, those metaphors are just um, a way to remind them that, that the judgment of God on their lifestyle is, is, is as certain as the sun coming up tomorrow, to use my illustration, not his. That it's just, that's going to happen. So then he quotes verse 14 and 15, an interesting quote from the book of Enoch. Have you read the book of Enoch lately? You can. It's in the Apocrypha. You can read the book of Enoch. It's not a, uh, well, it's interesting, I guess. Uh, but he quotes from Enoch who prophesied, and the word prophesied uh, has to be always understood, and this is true throughout Scripture. We read, we hear the word prophesied, and we think that means it tells the future. No, prophesy means to pro proclaim the Word of God. Not to foretell, but to foretell, to proclaim the Word of God. And so he proclaimed the Word of God, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness, which they have committed in such an ungodly way, of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken to him. Does he, you think he's making a point? Yeah. Ungodly. Yeah. <laughs> he says it, what, four times at least? Times. You can't, you know, this is, uh, these are ungodly people. He's unscoring the coming judgment against their ungodliness. What they are doing is not godly. It's ungodly. And so just as Enoch proclaimed judgment is coming it's coming and our role, our task is simply to wait until it comes uh, and that's what he says in verses 17 and um, oh, oh, verse, uh, skip verse 16 I, I love this they are grumblers malcontents they follow their own sinful desires they are loud mouth boasters uh, <laughs> Showing favoritism to gain advantage. Do you know anybody like that? Mm. Loud mouth boasters who will manipulate you and and give you all kinds of oh, there's a, I had a I had a friend like that was like that. He would he would heap all kinds of good things on you so that you would do what he wanted you to do. Uh, that's what they are. They are manipulators, loud mouth boasters. Um, have nothing to do with them. You must remember verse 17. The predictions of the apostles uh, and um, our Lord Jesus Christ. They said in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passion. Someone look up 2 Timothy chapter 3. The first five verses. 2 Timothy 3. This is what he's referring to. There are a couple of other instances where in, in the book of Acts and in, in other places where the prophet, the, the apostles warned of these kind of people. Second Timothy 3 is pretty telling. Um, Lynn, do you have that? Would you read it, please? Use the mic. Which verses? 1 to 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. Okay, pretty, pretty descriptive of these kinds of people. And so these apostles said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Uh, they will cause divisions, worldly people are devoid of spirit. They will cause division. Sin always causes division. Wherever sin shows up, it creates conflict. It creates division. It gets people to divide. Uh, against one side or the other. This is good, this is not, this is right, this is wrong. Sin always divides. And so when sin-filled people get among you, it will cause division. You can know Satan's at work when there is division. He invariably will divide us. And the only thing that heals that division is forgiveness. 
So here's your defense, verse 20. If you're looking for something to take home out of this whole thing, here's your defense, verse 20 and 21. Be you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. You want to not give in to these or any other false teachers? Stay in the Word. Continue in the Word. Let the Holy Spirit guide you through the Word of God, and that will that will keep you. And hang on to it because finally uh, we are waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ever since uh, Ascension Day, which is today, by the way. Today is Ascension Day. And uh, we should be having a worship service, what we should be doing. We'll do that Sunday. Um, but from the, what did Jesus, what did the angels say to the to the disciples as they looking up, wait, trying to find Jesus, he said, as you saw him go, so he will come again. And the church has been waiting ever since. That's the posture of the church. We wait. We wait for the coming of our Lord. But we do not wait idly. We do not just sit around twiddling our thumbs with our eyes in the sky saying, okay, God, whenever. That's not what we do. Verse 22, have mercy on those who doubt save others by snatching them out of the fire. Uh, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by flesh. While we are waiting, we are searching out those who are lost. We are trying to bring back those who have been, been uh, led astray. We're trying to rescue those who have been shown the wrong path. That's our task as the church, to bring, to reach out to others and bring them back. Um, but doing so, showing mercy with fear. In other words, with a, with a healthy dose of fear that you too might be tempted away. So with fear and trembling, we get out there and we seek out those avoiding even the garments stained by the flesh, those uh, polluted garments. Um, stay away from all of that. Uh, so hang in there, stay in the word as we wait for the coming. <coughs> and then verse 20, uh, uh, 24 is, is a gorgeous um, doxology. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's the promise. God will keep you from stumbling. These other perverted people stumbled God will prevent that from you if you continue in his word if you continue close to him so the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time now and forever it's just a pronouncement of the glory and the majesty and the power of God that is ours through Jesus Christ it's a beautiful uh, doxology that he ends his letter with so there you go. That's the letter of Jude in a very quick and, and uh, fashion. Uh, you can read a couple books about it if you want to, but uh, <laughs> but that's that's in essence what the letter is. But it, I find it very timely because if there's anything that corrupts us, it's the same thing that corrupted them back then. The temptations of the flesh, the perversions that we, the 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 license that we give to one another. Oh, that. I, I can't, I, so many times I had somebody who was caught up in, in the perversions and they said, well, anything that, that, uh, that feels that good can't be wrong. Well, yeah, it can. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but I keep hearing that regularly, that that's what, uh, what they say. And oh, no, that's, that's justification. We find all kinds of ways to justify our own sinful lifestyle because we know it's wrong. And so we find some way for to twist the word of God so that God says it's okay. And that's what they did. You want a lot of grace? Go out and sin a bunch and you get a grace. That's their message. Sounds tempting. <coughs> but it's a corruptive lifestyle that will ultimately destroy you. Okay, I'll stop talking and see if you've got any comments or questions. <coughs> yes, Jack. The thing that always, you know, I, I think about periodically when I mean, Jude talks about the angels and the wars they've had in heaven. And, right. And Satan gets thrown out. And mm -hmm. 
You know, it, it always amazes me there's a there's still a battle going mm -hmm. on, a spiritual battle right. uh, in heaven that transcends to us. Right. And we don't even know that it's going on. I don't know right. that it's going on. And it's a, it's a continuous battle. Right. It is a continuous battle, and we need to be careful that uh, as we condemn that lifestyle, but there, but for the grace of God, go I. Yeah. We need, and that's the fear that he talks about. We need to recognize that all of us are can be susceptible to that if we are not on guard, if we're not paying attention. It, we can be enticed into that pretty easily, pretty quickly. Uh, the temptations are out there. Satan knows where your weak point is. Trust me, he does. And he will, that's where he'll zero in on you, wherever your weak point is. Uh, and that's where we need to pray fervently that God would give us the, the wherewithal to defeat Satan. Other comments? Yes, Judy. Well, the way the, I've been to public schools now, the way they're trying to force all this um, LGBTQ mm -hmm. education on our children, how do we... <laughs> the proper training begins in the home, and that's where it starts, and that's where the battle needs to be fought, in the home. Um, and we in the church are there to help that battle in the home. But finally it comes down to the battle in the home. That's where it needs to be fought. And I, unfortunately, that's being lost in a lot of homes, but that finally is where the battle is. Anything we can do to build up the home. Comments? Questions? Yes? Early in the study here today, you said something about sexual sins of the worst kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, sin, all sin, does the same thing to us. Yep. Separates us from, from God. Right. So I think we have to be careful about dividing types of sin in that then we can excuse ourselves. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we talk about little lies, you know, or, or small sins, and that wasn't that big deal. Yeah, we, that's very true, Jim. We need to be very, very careful that we categorize sin, but that's for our own justification. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that one. That's not too big. This one's bigger. So, But you're right. We have to be very careful of that. We also, um, on the other hand, like to condemn people if, they've, if, it's a, if it's a worse sin in our category, then we can really rain God's punishment on them. If it's a not too bad sin, well, that's okay. We can let that go. <laughs> but that's we do that. Yes. Elaine. It bothers me, and sometimes I'll see somebody and you can just know their game. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, she, she says, you, you know, some of you know, you know a person's gay. Be careful that we do not judge the book by its cover, okay? And, and I mean that, so don't, don't judge people just based on their, on their appearance. Um, that's very dangerous. Uh, but at the same time, we need to continually pray for those who are affected. I have dealt with a number of people uh, that have been involved in the whole gay lifestyle, um, they battle that. It's, a, it's really a struggle for them. It's not something to just pass off and say, don't do that. That's just really, really a struggle for a lot of people. Um, and, and, and that's the discussion that, that they have, that they're born with they, they have that uh, tendency for that, and, and all those things. But we have to be careful that that may be true, but that's not a, re, a license to do whatever you want to do. Okay. All right. Next, uh, we have two more weeks, and I and I have a study on prayer. If that's okay with you folks, we're going to delve into a little bit of the background of uh, of what prayer is all about, uh, and um, what constitutes real prayer, what's true prayer, what's not true prayer. Um, and I will not have. I, I'm not going to give into the heresy of a certain knowledge that if you have a certain formula, 
Then if your hands are folded correctly, by the way, it's right thumb on top of left, um, <laughs> not the other way. That's, that's liturgically correct, right? You like? So um, if you pray with your left thumb on top, forget it. They, those prayers are not heard. <laughs> right thumb on top of left is the correct. Uh, <laughs> you laugh, but we're taught that in liturgics. <laughs> Dick, did they teach you that? Of course they did. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm not making this up. That's really, that's, that's the proper way. No, I'm not making it up. That's... No, it's first year, actually. It's first year. First year. But uh, we're, we'll talk about prayer and, and, and uh, what a great gift this is from God to us and, and uh, that we need to faithfully use it regularly. So... Uh, we'll get into that. Let's close with prayer right now. Good and gracious God, we ask your blessing upon us. Uh, as we go our ways today, uh, be with us and guide us uh, as we seek to serve you in all that we do. May we be faithful to you uh, and resist the temptations of Satan, however it comes to us. Uh, continue to give us your strength. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Have a great day. Thank you.